Well, welcome. We're going to play a little music by Taj Mahal while we're waiting for other people to join us. So sit back and relax. A little music uh, called Light Rain. Baby, falling down. Soon as it hit my window, pain, I'm sure to hit the ground. Welcome. We're just waiting for everyone to join us. Like just a few minutes. <laughs> Maybe we should get started and people can join us um, as they can and catch up. Yep, you have a handful of people here. So, yes, I would go ahead and get started. I'm going to get started. Sure. Okay. Well, I'd like to say hi to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today, particularly since outside in our area today is gorgeous. I was just outside. I was hearing all kinds of stuff. It was hard to come in. So thank you so much for joining us today. My name's Marion Miller. I work for the Mystic River Watershed Association. I am the watershed educator. And I'm joined by a colleague today. Well, hi everyone. Um, my name is Elo Denius. Uh, I'm actually the newest uh, member to the Mystic River Watershed Association family. I'm excited. Um, I'm jealous of anybody right now who's outside enjoying the weather. I hear tomorrow like 75 degrees. Um, but I actually love the Mystic, um, to be honest with everyone. Um, I understand um, there's over 600,000 people um, who, who live near rivers, lakes, uh, and streams in our area and are just unaware of the potential threats um, that we could actually face. Um, so my team and I and a lot of the community members uh, just work extremely hard to uh, help serve, protect, and most importantly, inform and get in, in people involved in the work that we're doing in the back door environmentally and just to help out. And I just want to give a quick shout out to all our amazing donors and supporters. There's over 900 plus of them who actually donate their time and money. So thank you for making anything possible. Um, and I just want to throw it back to Marion. <laughs> Great, thanks, Elo. Um, all right, so we've done a little bit of intro of who we are, but we're wondering about you. So in a minute, not yet, um, we're gonna take a poll. I wanna say that the chat function is open and Elo has generously um, volunteered to sort of make sure things are going smoothly there. I think he has some info to add as we go through this program. But you could also, if you wanted to, um, in the chat feature, uh, say hello. And if you're a young person, which we hope there are some people who are not adults, you could maybe add how old you are. So, um, that's maybe what you can do this moment while I get ready to do our poll. And hopefully, let's see, we can do this. All right, so, this is tricky. I think you can do it. If you are unable to make this work, you could also put this information in the chat. But our question is, where are you now? What city or town are you from and what state? So 
to do this, you have to go to menti.com. You can do that on whatever device you're on now, or if you're on a computer and you want to use your phone, just tap in menti.com, and then you have to enter this code, 44690061. And there'll be a form that you can answer that question in, um, and we'll get to see the results. So let's see if that's going to work, I hope. Oops. All right, I see somebody's from Cambridge already. Maybe other people can add in. Ah, uh, Somerville, Cambridge again. Arlington, Somerville, Cambridge. Well, welcome. So I like that so far everybody is close to us and also potentially in the watershed, which is really cool. Um, uh, Reading, also in our watershed. Cambridge again. Yes. Newton. Uh, Reading, Cambridge, Cambridge. All right. Well, so glad you're here. And this work. That's awesome. Good job. All right. I also have another question we would like an answer to. Um, so rivers, brooks, lakes, ponds, marshes, streams, harbors, and oceans, all water. And we're really talking about water today. Which are your favorites? So again, go to menti.com and enter the code, and we'll see if people what people's favorites are. Sort of to get us in the space of thinking about water. Oh, it looks like lake is people's favorite so far. Oceans, oceans and rivers, brooks, rivers, lakes, um, oceans, oceans and rivers. I would have to say I can't choose a favorite. They all have a special spot for me for different reasons. So, wow, awesome. Thanks for taking our poll. And I'm so glad it worked out. That was a win, Elo. That's great. Um, all right, so we now know a little bit about you and you know a little bit about us um, and thinking about water. Sort of our purpose today is to help people know a little bit more about um, stormwater pollution, which right now is the greatest threat to clean water, um, something I never knew. And I also wanted to share what young people are thinking and doing in the watershed. So um, that is our purpose purpose. Um, but I just wanted to say before I went any further that stormwater pollution was something I really never knew about until I started working for the Mystic River Watershed Association. So, you know, I thought I was pretty savvy, Elo, but I knew nothing about stormwater pollution. I just didn't know. So um, I'm happy to know a thing or two about it and be able to share that. How about you? <laughs> Don't worry about it, Marianne. Um, I absolutely knew zero um, about stormwater, about any of this, okay? I, I, got, I grew up in Cambridge um, and then I didn't really get educated in what stormwater was till I met, uh, of course, you and uh, the Myra team. And I found out uh, stormwater actually leads uh, to pollution as well in our water. And I personally don't want that. <laughs> Yeah, it's an invisible problem. It's really surprising how few people uh, know about it. So um, that's where we're going to start. Like, whoa, have you seen storm drains in the roadways or on sidewalks or playgrounds or parking lots? Um, have you ever noticed it? Have you wondered about it? They're almost everywhere, and yet we walk by them all the time and don't even think twice. So what are they and what do they do is really our purpose here. So storms and pollution, how are they connected? We're going to find out a little bit about stormwater pollution. We're going to discover what some young people are thinking about in our watershed and also some things that they are doing. And we're going to think about what you can do, or maybe you're going to think about it. I might not be thinking about that to help reduce stormwater pollution 
and we're going to have a time for questions and answers. So feel free, if you have a question, to put it in the chat. Um, Elo, again, volunteered to help um, manage the questions in the chat, and we'll have time for questions at the end. So that's how it's going to go. But I wanted to start first with a view. Um, Elo, did you want to say anything before we look at a map? No, of course. Um, I got a chance to uh, see the map um, earlier this week that Mary was showing me. Um, but before Marion even gets into uh, the presentation, I, I want you guys to know uh, who's giving the presentation to you guys this evening. Um, so I recently met Marion, but after talking to her, um, I realized she's been doing this line of work and been this, in this field for over two decades. <laughs> so that's, that's amazing. Um, she has so much knowledge um, and she has impacted people um, all age groups, because she actually works with education. So people from the elementary school level to even younger, to people who are young adults like myself. Um, so I hope you guys pay attention. Um, I know outside is beautiful, but just enjoy this presentation for the brief time that we have. But Marianne, go ahead, you, you can take it away. Oh, thanks, Ewa, <laughs> that was really nice. Now, I, I have a job I really like. I get to talk to so many people about um, interesting things. And stormwater pollution sounds like something that might not be so interesting, but as it's turned out, it's fascinating. And young people and older people, I talked to a garden club recently, were fascinated by this topic because really so many people know so little about it. So I'm here talking about the Mystic River and water pollution and stormwater pollution and our watershed. So I thought we'd start with a map, which ideally we would have started looking at this right here. So since this is part of the Cambridge Science Festival, I'm starting in Cambridge. This is Ale Life Tea Station. You might recognize it, although it's hard to recognize from above. Um, so that's where we're gonna start, Alewife Tea Station. So Alewife Tea Station is um, <clears throat> in Cambridge. It's also within the Mystic River watershed. Um, one third of Cambridge is in our watershed and two thirds of Cambridge is in um, the Charles River watershed. The Mystic is often not very well known. Everybody knows the Charles. Very few people know the Mystic. Um, the Alewife Tea Station is situated in a place where there's quite a bit of open space. You can see some water. This is a little river um, that feeds into Alewife Brook that eventually feeds into the Mystic River. So we'll see that in a minute. Um, the area where Alewife Tea Station is used to be called the Great Marsh because it was a low place in the land that used to hold a lot of water. So let's see if we can find rivers. So Fresh Pond right here, Spy Pond in Arlington. There's water body up here, which maybe we can pull down. This is Lower Mystic Lake and here is a river. And that's the Mystic River, that's our river. That's the river I work for. So part of my job is to let people know a little bit about the river because they don't know so much. It's kind of an unknown river. Let's see where it's headed. All right, so, ooh, maybe I can zoom back in a little bit. So here's the Mystic River and it comes down. Here's uh, Somerville, here's Everett, Malden, um, Chelsea. Charlestown comes down and empties into Boston Harbor right here. So you probably are seeing this other river. This is the famous river, the river everybody knows, the Charles River that winds down around from Hopkinton. It meanders a lot and ends up in Boston Harbor about the same place that the Mystic River does. The Mystic River has a couple of tributaries. You can see, um, you know, rivers that come in connected. The Mystic River is not a long river. It's seven miles, this is its beginning, to the Boston Harbor. So it's not big, but it's really important. It's an important river, especially for life in our area. So the inner harbor right here of Boston connects to the outer harbor, which connects to the Atlantic Ocean. So really the Mystic River is a conduit for water and other things right out to the ocean. 
we're not that far from it. Charles River also, this is the Neponset River. So three rivers um, come together in Boston Harbor. So the other thing I wanted you to notice about this map is as Elo had mentioned, there are about 600,000 people in our watershed. We're not a big river, we're not a big watershed, but we are the most densely populated watershed in all of New England, which is you know, pretty nice. Hey, we're an urban river, we're a working river for um, the people who live here, but that also creates some challenges for our river. So let me see if I can share another thing because that's that's kind of an important story about uh, the challenges of stormwater pollution is just how many people live in our area. So um, I don't know if you know this, I never knew it. Again, there's a lot of things I never knew before I worked for the Mystic River. The river gets a report card every single year. All rivers in Massachusetts do, and probably all rivers in the United States, but I only know about Massachusetts. So every year, water quality data is collected by the Environmental Protection Agency, and they produce a river report card. So this helps us to know the water quality in the river. This report card is only about bacteria. This reports bacteria levels, but there are report cards that report other pollutants like um, nitrogen and phosphorus in particular. Anyway, um, oops, I'm so sorry. The Mystic River has had quite a history of pollution in its lifetime. And a lot of people who don't know too much about the Mystic River um, think that it's highly polluted. And there have been times where it was. But right now, the great news is the river is cleaner than it has ever been. And you can tell, really, by its report card. The green area, the Mystic Lakes and the river itself and Chelsea Creek, which is a tributary, all have really good water quality when it comes to bacteria. Um, bacteria is important because bacteria is, first of all, invisible. You can't tell by looking at the water if there are high levels of bacteria and it also impacts human health. So people want to know, is the water clean? I should say that in our watershed, in all our watershed, all the lakes and ponds and brooks and streams and rivers and lakes, uh, there is no drinking water there. People in the Boston area do not drink any water from the Mystic River, but that doesn't mean that water quality isn't important. So river report card, who knew? Um, the river, again, is cleaner than it has ever been, and in some places it's a gorgeous river, in other places it's an urban river, um, and so it's kind of a mixed bag. This is Medford, and you can see there's vegetation, plants, trees, beautiful trees, a great view. It's hard to see. The city is right over here, um, and plants are important to water quality, which is one reason I chose this picture of the river. Um, trees in particular, we know are good for air, air quality. Trees help keep things cool. They also help to manage storm water. Um, and that's something I didn't know about. Their roots help to pull water down into the ground so we can recharge um, the groundwater. And their leaves, when they have leaves on them, it disrupts a heavy rainfall. So when we have heavy rain, um, some of it can sort of drip down more slowly and um, get into the soil. So that was one view of the river, but several miles downstream, not very far, uh, this is what the river looks like. And maybe some people recognize the Mystic Tobin Bridge. Um, fun fact, it's the longest bridge in Massachusetts. It goes over the Mystic River right before it enters Boston Harbor, um, you can see there is a lot of human activity, right? Buildings, bridges, roads. You can see right here, this is called Little Mystic Channel and the whole river's edge or the channel's edge has been constructed. It's not a natural um, bank of the river anymore. People have 
sort of uh, installed the bank they want to be so that there is more space for parking cars for Logan Airport and for other activities. The Mystic River is our working river. It's the river that can handle big freighter ships that come from the ocean and bring things to the Boston area that we need, like oil and gas. You can see the tanks right here. So a tanker would unload right here in Chelsea. These also oil and gas. There are tanks that hold jet fuel for Logan Airport. There is road salt that comes on big tankers or, or big ships on the ocean, from the ocean that offload in Charlestown over here in Chelsea and produce and new cars. So the Mystic is a working river. These things don't happen on the Charles. It's not deep enough. There isn't the infrastructure. So I think that's a compelling part of the story of the Mystic and its water quality which again, it's cleaner than it has ever been. And despite all this human activity, and I guess I'll give an editorial comment, people are so smart, so smart. Look at what we're able to do right here in this picture. We built all this stuff. We can do so many things, but a lot of things that we do do and build um, provide a challenge for the ecosystem. So I'm, just putting that out there. So I said today we were going to figure out storms and pollution and how are they connected. So stormwater pollution is pretty much what it sounds like. It is pollution that happens when we have big storms. And you might have noticed, since everybody seems local here, you might have noticed that we get some pretty heavy rainstorms now in a way that I don't remember before. And when the rain comes down hard, we have a heavy rain, the water has to have somewhere to go. So back to the beginning when I said, have you seen these storm drains before? Have you ever thought about them? Their purpose is really to stop our roads and homes and businesses and parking lots from flooding. That's their purpose. Because when we get a big storm, that water has to go somewhere. And if you think back to the map I showed you the, from the satellite view, there was a lot of paved area. There's a lot of roads and big roofs like the T-Station and parking lots and built surfaces that don't allow the water to go anywhere. So we have to have a system so we're not flooding. So that really creates the circumstances for stormwater pollution. So stormwater is the water from storms, but the pollution part is what's here on the ground that that water is rushing over. Whatever's on that ground that could potentially be a pollutant is picked up by the water on the road that's going into the storm drain. Like maybe somebody didn't pick up their dog poop. Um, water would rush over and pick up bacteria. Usually people don't purposely throw trash in the street, but you know, there's a lot of trash and plastic that ends up on the roadway that can get washed into storm drains. Or um, a car could be leaking oil and gas that would end up in the storm drain. Again, not a lot of things, but boy, it adds up really quickly. So pollution can get down in the storm drain, but um, wow, what happens after that? So this is just a reminder, this is a quick way to think about stormwater pollution. Rain picks up pollutants, trash included, that's the pollution we see, but also invisible pollutants like fertilizer running off of lawns or parks. Um, dog waste, like I said, please pick up your poop, even if it's, or dog poop, even if it's not in the street, even if it's on the grass next to the street. Rainwater can wash bacteria into the um, rivers or the closest water body. Um, in the winter, extra salt from the roads runs into the storm drain and that is really adding salt to freshwater systems. So a lot of the pollution we don't really see and we don't think about. So those are the things that make stormwater polluted. It's a little more complicated than that. This is like quick down and dirty. I think Elo put some links in the chat where you could find a more in-depth explanation of the problem of stormwater pollution. So 
um, again, just a quick one. So once pollution and stormwater go down that drain, where does it go? Directly through pipes, underground, again, invisible. You don't see it, you don't know it, you don't think about it, to the closest water body. So both of these pipes are outflows, meaning it's the far end of the storm drain. So whatever went down in the storm drain, if it doesn't get caught in the pipes, is going to come out here into the closest water body. This is the mystic um, in Arlington. So pollution ends up in there, unfiltered, untreated. And I think most people don't know that. Water that comes out of your homes, used water, dirty water, gets cleaned up at the sewage treatment plant in our area, Deer Island. But stormwater never gets cleaned up. It's not processed in any way. So you might also think about, of course, when you've been out in the woods or at a big park or whatever, you don't see storm drains because they're not needed. It's a way that we're making sure our built environments don't flood. But nature's really good at handling its own business, I guess I could say. We like land that's flat, but if you're out in a natural area, the land isn't flat at all. There's dips and bumps and places where water can be held when we have a big rainstorm. Water also can run off the land and down into a water body. You know, water runs downhill and the water bodies are lower than most of the land around. So nature kind of works it out. As I said, trees are really helpful for managing stormwater and in natural areas, there are a lot of trees. In fact, if we didn't mow the lawns in our parks and yards, the land here would wanna be forest. That's just what the ecology is. If you didn't touch a thing and came back in 10 years, it would be a young forest because that's the way the land is supposed to be. So nature has been disrupted by people. And so we have to think about, you know, how we manage our storm water now or extra water. So communities are thinking about this in a big way now, because as I said, stormwater pollution is now the biggest source of pollution in our waterways. Industry doesn't pollute anymore. Businesses aren't allowed to discharge um, pollution into rivers and waterways. So it really is stormwater is what's polluting our waterways. So communities are thinking about how to solve this problem. And one thing they've done is create or mimic what nature does. So this is a rain garden. This one's in Arlington, but in almost every community in the watershed, um, things like rain gardens are showing up or bioretention areas, which again, is just a space where water can be. So here, They've taken a piece of the road, which they didn't need, put in a new curb, left space, so there's some soil, and they planted plants that can help manage water. So when we have a big rain, the water doesn't have to run down here. Some of it can be here, have a place to sit while it seeps into the ground. If we have an enormous storm, which we've been having quite a few enormous storms, the water, extra water from this um, rain garden can end up in a storm drain that's down here. So, you know, engineers are thinking about fixes for this. Town managers are thinking about this. Departments of Public Works are thinking about what we could do. Also, I wanted to just show you this space between the sidewalk and what used to be the street is also a more naturalized area. It's not grass. It's got some things we call weeds, which really weeds are plants we don't want in that space. But grass is not great at managing stormwater, doesn't let it down in. Other plants, things we call weeds, are much better at managing stormwater. So anyway, there's a down and dirty about some things that are happening that are really positive. So cities and towns are also cleaning out their storm drains. That's one thing they're doing to reduce pollution. They're sweeping the streets um, who knew that sweeping streets really impacts water quality, but it does. There are some communities, Cambridge in particular, um, sweeps the streets once a month, except for maybe in the winter time. And when they do that, they're cleaning up all the stuff that's on the street, that if we had a big rain, 
would wash into storm drain drains. So that's, you know, who would think that sweeping the streets would keep water clean, but it does. Um, they're creating rain gardens and bioretention areas, just like I said before. They're installing trash rakes in certain water bodies. A trash rake is just a big metal piece that um, will catch trash or booms, sort of plastic, orange things that catch trash so that people can clean it up. And they're planting trees. Again, trees help with so many things, air, Cool down, cools down the city and also provides um, some help for stormwater. So as we said, clean water is important to all life, not just people, but all life. The river and the land along the edge of the river, the parks, but also um, the other parts of the river that don't have parks, they're a real resource for people. And that's one thing I like to be sure that everybody knows. Stormwater is a problem, and sometimes we talk about all the problems, but I want you to think about the benefit too. Water is just a magnet. It's a place to cool down in the, in the summertime. It is a cool place. It's an interesting place. So I don't want to be like super negative. Um, all right. So I also like to remember that wildlife, not just people, but other animals, um, really need clean water. And the plants, as I noted, are super important. So these are just three of my favorite animals that are seen regularly in our watershed. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears. What I do for my work is I talk to, well, I'll say educate, because talk to sounds bad, like I'm telling them stuff. Um, I help people to know, youth in particular, about our watershed and the benefits and the challenges. When I first started doing stormwater pollution as a program three years ago, I thought this was gonna be awful. Like it was hard to wrap my head around how I could tell the story of stormwater pollution in a way that young people would resonate with it. I have to say, I have never been more wrong it grabbed, that idea just grabbed so many students, you know, something to think about. It's a real world problem. It's right in your own backyard. It's invisible. You don't see it or think about it. And really one of the big things you can do is tell other people about it. So it's been a tremendously successful program. And I'm pretty sure I probably talked to or educated or done programs for about a thousand people, young people, in the past three years, even virtual this year, which is much more um, challenging. Anyway, so some of the things they're doing is thinking about designing engineering fixes for stormwater systems. Here's a diagram that fifth grader, a group of fifth graders drew. Here's the storm drain. Here's where the water goes in. There's a filter right here to pull out leaves, which also are oddly pollutants, and trash before the water empties the Mystic River. There was a, an idea that there would be a way to divide the water with trash and the water that didn't have trash so that the filter didn't filter all the water. Fifth graders, the thinking was amazing. Um, and they built a 3D model of that and we tested it. Other groups talk a lot or think a lot about telling others about pollution in so many ways. It's exciting. It's great when people are excited about a project and they tell others. Um, I've got students in Somerville who are interested in helping with trash surveys in their own neighborhood. So they're letting us know where there are places with the most trash with the idea that then the city would know and could maybe sweep the streets more often in that area or some other mitigation. And also people volunteer to just pick up litter, which is so helpful because litter is what we see. It's the pollution that we see. So in so many ways, this is a message to stop polluting the Mystic River because there are animals and other things that live there. It's a public service announcement that these students in Everett decided would be good to tell other people about stormwater pollution. They didn't know about stormwater pollution. 
they were going to tell other people. And I think that's exciting. Um, another thing that a lot of students are thinking about, a lot of young people, is some storm drains do have labels on them. But I don't know if you've noticed them. Um, the labels don't really tell much about what this thing is or why it's a problem. So this was a high school student's idea to make a drain label. And her idea was keep our water clean. This is not a dumpster. And then to tell people overtly, this is not a, this is only for stormwater. It's not a home for waste. In other words, not a dumpster, which she set up here. And I have seen many people drop things down there, um, a bag of dog poop, for example. Um, and mostly they don't know. It looks like a place to pull waste. Um, so they were thinking about that. Uh, this is my friend um, who volunteered to talk about her thoughts about stormwater pollution and labels. So here you go. Let's do it. So this sign doesn't make sense to me. It's like if you're a grown up, you might, you might know, but to kids, it makes no sense. Okay? It says no dumping, like what are we not dumping? And drains to waterways. Like, what does waterways mean? So, I think that we can have a better thinking more of an idea. My sign that I designed said no dumping trash, stay healthy, so fish can live and be healthy. Let's do it. Let so, um, thinking about it, I, it's interesting for me to see life through somebody else's eyes. And I agree so much with her that no dumping drains to waterways really doesn't make sense. There could be a better way to tell people. Um, so well done. I have another take on what a label could be. So there's another friend of mine who volunteered to help me out. Do you see this? This is a storm drain. Any trash that is on the road when it rains, the rain washes it into the storm drain. This label is meant to tell people about that problem, but it doesn't do a very good, jo good job at it. For one thing, the circle makes it hard to read. And for another thing, these don't even look like fish. So that's why I have designed something that would be a better label for the storm drains. It, show it shows that any trash that's dumped ends up in the water, whether it... So again, another design, another way to tell people what this is about. And I'm so um, thankful that those two friends of mine were able to talk about that. Um, another group of students, so this is middle school students in Somerville, this fall had me come and talk to them, or their teacher did, about stormwater pollution. They were working on a project about ocean plastics. So, so many students are know about the problem of ocean plastics. But really what people don't know is that almost all of the plastic in the ocean starts its life on land. So it's not that people on boats in the ocean are dumping plastic. It's that that plastic bottle that's right outside your home on the street can fit through a storm drain or get blown into a waterway and make its way, as you remember from the map, from where you are through the storm drain to the closest water body, to the river, to the harbor, to the ocean, where tides have a way of collecting plastic together. But, you know, this big problem of ocean plastics is really a whole lot about stormwater, which again, invisible, people don't know, um, very interesting. Uh, let me see if I can stop sharing for a minute because I was lucky enough to be able to talk to um, some Girl Scouts the other day. I had uh, talked to them in the, Ooh, about a year ago, not a little more than a year ago, about um, stormwater pollution. And they were thinking about a project they were working on that had to do with recycling. 
So here you so go. So in Girl Scouts, we're currently working on our Silver Award project. And so we have to pick a sustainable um, project to do for the year to get our Silver Award. So we were thinking of different ways we could help our community. Um, and we just all noticed lots of trash and things around our environment uh, in our community that we thought we could uh, help get rid of. Yeah, and I think so. It started with us wanting to help with pollution. And then as we started to kind of learn more about how people dispose of things, we got more interested in the recycling aspect because, um, because we were learning like all of the mistakes people make um, all the time and all of the things that people just don't really know. And so we thought that that might be a good way to go because a lot of people are recycling things thinking, oh, if I'm recycling it, it's fine. So when we first started coming up with our idea for a project, we were gonna do something about like in the public schools, how they have like styrofoam trays and how like they keep reusing them and that kind of stuff. And then we were like, well, that could be like not a sustainable goal that's not going to get anywhere. So we changed our idea around. And then we were going to make a sticker uh, and that was going to be our project about like people for people to stick on their recycling bins that says, before you put this in your recycling, think, is it recyclable? And then like have like different things that can go in your recycling versus what can't. And then we just figured we might as well just not do that because that could be expensive like to get all the printing and stuff and so we decided why not do a workshop for younger girl scouts because you know they're the younger generation so they're gonna you know help the planet as they get older so they won an award for the work that they're doing um which is pretty interesting um and also uh, they're doing a workshop for younger Girl Scouts right now, today. They couldn't be here. So um, that is kind of interesting, I think. But, you know, trash, it seems like recycling, again, might not be important um, to uh, stormwater, and yet it is. That's the... Um, it's what we see. So I'm trying, Elo, to share my screen, and I'm not sharing it, right? Um, so. Not yet. Okay, now uh, hold on a minute. A technical glitch. One second, please hang with me, people. I've almost got it. <laughs> Thank you. amazing <laughs> <laughs> oh no oh i played from the start i was doing so well this was really very challenging um for me personally and i thought i was gonna get through with no errors and here i am you are you're doing an absolutely great job oh, you know, thank especially you. for friday i know everybody can agree right oh, okay. <laughs> you're doing great mm -hmm. all right so trash doesn't seem like it's related to stormwater pollution but it sure is um, and I have another friend who was going to say a quick thing about trash. Um, so here we have all the stuff that wound up in the storm plates. So there is a soda can, um, gloss, um, a glove. There was also this rope thing. Two and uh, nail polish. See, um, this made me very surprising to you because you probably always thought that, that things that end up with storm grains are candy wrappers or little bits of trash. That is not true, as there is sunglasses, um, spray, uh, gloves, shoes, nail polish. Basically, everything they probably thought would never be in there. So, um, maybe next time you walk by one, make sure that you don't drop anything. So, that's great advice. Thank you, Lauren. I appreciate it. Um, 
the holes in storm drains are bigger than you think. And the things that can fit through are super surprising. In the winter, there's a lot of gloves. In the summer, there's a lot of sunglasses. Right now, you know, a, a variety of things. So now you know a little bit about stormwater pollution um, and you might know a little bit more about what your community is doing, but I want, I'm want i hoping that you're thinking about what you can do. So our tips are pick up after your dog, easy. Don't drop it in the storm drain, please. Um, plant flowers, shrubs, and trees if you can because a variety of plants really does help to reduce some types of pollution. If you aren't able to do something like that, please care for the trees and shrubs that are already there. Um, recycle plastics. So this has been on our list of things to do forever. Um, and you can hear that young people are thinking about that really very much right now. And really one of the most important things and the easiest thing you can do is tell other people about stormwater pollution, which is really what many of the people many of the young people, many of the students in our watershed are doing right now in such interesting ways. So I want to thank you, um, my friends who helped out, um, and also to so many um, students that I've worked with in the past who've asked great questions or done interesting projects or who have um, contributed to my understanding of stormwater pollution from the perspective of someone who doesn't know already. So I guess that's it. I, I think I'm done talking, Elo, finally. <laughs> no, I, I wish you can keep talking, Marion. I'm, I'm actually learning so much. I thought I was done with school. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is so great. Um, yeah. But again, guys, just um, if you have any questions, just uh, put in the chat or shoot it directly uh, towards us. Um, but I do have a question uh, personally for myself. Sorry guys, I'm being a little selfish now. Um, one question that I, I personally have is um, who, who picks up the trash uh, in the river? Oh, that's a great question, Elo. Because anybody who's been along any river, could be the Charles or the Mystic, all the rivers have the same problems. There is a lot of trash. So who picks it up? Um, the answer is it's not really anybody's job per se. There's no one that has a job to go out and clean the rivers. So for us in the Mystic Watershed, we have volunteer groups that sometimes come out and help pick up trash. We have students who sometimes get together and pick up trash. Um, we have scout groups that get together and pick up trash. And there are a lot of adult groups that will volunteer on a weekend, a work weekend that we're hosting. So I think there's a trash cleanup coming as part of our Earth Day celebrations. And you could find out more, I think, on our website, mysticriver.org. Um, but really, it's nobody's job. It's all done by people who are volunteering or want to help. So we have nobody that works for us whose job it is to pick up the trash. We all pick some up, but it's nobody's job. Wow. See, that, that just proves how special our volunteers are. Um, thank you so much. Um, but one question that we did have, um, um, one, what one of the attendees asked was, uh, is the lower mystic deep enough for shipping naturally or because it is drenched to make it deeper? Oh, it's a dredge. Ah, oh, that's a great question. And I would love to answer that question. I don't know. That's a new one. I love talking to people because you all have questions I can't answer. Um, is it dredge? I imagine yes. I don't know for a fact, but I believe that it would need to be dredged to maintain the depth, but I don't know. And if whoever asked that question could email me, um, I will find out the answer and let you know, because that's a great question. Mm, absolutely. And um, one more question yeah? um, is, um, are there a lot of face masks uh, in the river right now? That's a great question. I know COVID is ha happening. It's almost done. Very optimistic about, about that. But, um, <laughs> you can answer that. Um, well, I don't have exact data. Are there face masks in the river? Yes, because I've seen them for sure. Oh, that's to panelists. Um, Elo, can you help me out in the chat and put my email address? Absolutely. I, I uh, 
I send it to you and not everybody. Um, uh, yes, I've seen some, anything that ends up on the streets has the potential to be in the water. And I've seen a number of face masks on the street, like a lot. But, you know, that would be an interesting thing to think about. If there's a graduate student that anybody knows about that wants to do some research, maybe that would be a cool project. Are we seeing, you know, what is the problem of face masks in the river? How much, how many, that kind of thing. Hmm. Oh, nice. We have an interesting question that actually came in, right? The, the, the question was, why didn't people make the storm drains more like a filter? Oh my gosh, that's an awesome question. Well, um, that, that's why my students ask all the time. And they, they say if they were going to fix it, they would put a filter on it. Um, the biggest problem is that storm drains, I believe, so this is my take on it. We would have to ask the town engineers, but the system isn't new. The system was built quite a while ago. Um, and it was a time where we were thinking only about flooding, not about pollution. So it was an easy, well, not easy, but it was a relatively easy, inexpensive system that could get rid of water. It could put water in the rivers. We weren't thinking about rivers and lakes and ponds and streams and pollution in that way. So it was a system that was put in place and now would be so expensive to replace that we're living with the system we have. Mm. At some time, so here's another piece to this, in some communities, the sewage system and the stormwater system were connected. So that if there was too much sewage or if there was so much water in the system, the sewage would get mixed with stormwater and end up in the rivers. Um, that is being changed by all communities. There are a couple of communities in our watershed that are finishing that process because a federal law mandated it, that it had to be disconnected because of the amount of pollution that ends up in waterways, bacteria in particular, from sewage is a huge problem. Yeah, that, that, that is a great, great question. That question was actually asked by a 10 year old young man. Oh, um, so <laughs> that's an amazing question at, at your age, it, the ability to ask that type of question that having that thought process is amazing. I know, I know a lot of people um, older than you don't have that thought process. So keep it on as well. <laughs> oh, and I'll say one other thing. So mm -hmm. that system, the storm drain system, I don't think it's gonna stay the same. Again, my opinion over years because it's too much pollution going into our fresh waterways and eventually the ocean. So I bet that somebody figures out a way to fix it and maybe a way to fix it that requires less money. Part of the problem is we can't fix it because it's so expensive. It's been there forever. So actually so many students I've talked to have ideas like why isn't there a filter? Somebody needs to invent one and maybe the person who's gonna invent it is you, the person who asked the question. Awesome question. There should be a filter on one end <laughs> or the other. <laughs> That's great. If you're still listening, the amazing 10 year old young man who asked that question, you're in the hot seat. Um, so I look forward to seeing the work you do in the future as well. Um, but hey, hey everyone, um, like I said, when this, when this started, right? It, it is Friday. Um, I know you guys had a lot of education right now, a lot of knowledge about stormwater, but we want you guys to enjoy outside, okay? That's a secret. We want you guys to enjoy outside. If you see a storm drain, stop at it, look, take a picture, send it to us. We'll celebrate with you, but enjoy your weekend, 75 degrees, right? And thank you again for participating, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, get outside for sure. Thank you.